Okay, uh, folks, the February 8th um, meeting of the Citizens Advisory Committee is called to order. Everyone, please rise and face the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. And justice for all. Okay. Before we begin, I'd like to just do a couple of housekeeping items since we do have people attending virtually. First, everyone online and in person, please silence your cell phone and other noise making devices. If you are a member attending virtually, just to review how to operate the GoToWebinar platform, you should have a control panel that shows um, various tabs where you can mute and unmute yourself. You can also utilize the chat box within there if you would like to participate that way. And if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, please email Abby Hemingway at abby.hemingway at brevardfl.gov. Thank you. Okay, first up is public comments. Do we have any uh, public comments of non-agenda items? Oh, excuse me. Good morning, I'm Lisa Hickman, the Space Coast TPO Office Specialist. And I would like to establish a physical quorum here in, the, um, in our room. When I say your name, if you could please let me know if you're here. I have Mr. Vanny, Mr. Stoll, Mr. Tucker, here. Mr. Weinberg, here. Mr. Carter, Mr. Pettick, and I have Mr. Ramirez, Mr. Honeycutt, Mr. Kohler, here. Ms. Balzanto, Mr. Miller. Ms. Lawndales and Mr. D. Blau. Very good. So I have established that we do have quorum. So per policy and state law, public meetings are required to hold a physical meeting room and quorum. The governor previously had an executive order providing an exemption, which the executive order has ended. Members attending virtually are only able to vote if the physical quorum passes a motion to allow the virtual actions. So we are now seeking a motion to allow virtual attendees to vote due to extraordinary circumstances of COVID-19. Can I get a motion? Motion from Rochelle, do we have a second? Second from Greg. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye, all opposed. Motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, um, Mr. Chair, before we move into public comment, I'd like to do some housekeeping regarding the public attendees. So for the public, you are able to attend via computer, smartphone, telephone, appear in person, or you can watch online on our YouTube channel. If you are attending via GoToMeeting, you can utilize several ways to issue a public comment, either by using the question answer box or by raising your hand to be acknowledged and unmuted. Verbal and written comments will also be accepted three days after the meeting by emailing lisa.hickman at brevardfl.gov or calling our office at 321-690-6890. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, from the attendees, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? Seeing none, do we have any virtually? Seeing none, no public comments. Moving on to uh, item number four, and uh, it's our executive director's report. Uh, Georgia, uh, Georgiana, you have the virtual floor. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, members. Welcome to our first meeting of 2021. I first wanna apologize for not being there in person. I have been feeling a little under the weather and um, I'm much better, but I just wanna be careful and not share anything with you that I shouldn't. Um, for our new members, I, I look forward to meeting you in the future. We have a lot of exciting things we'll be working on this year. So uh, I think it's gonna be a very productive year. 
Wanted to let you know this morning, the Technical Advisory Committee uh, met and approved the consent agenda and the action items that we will be hearing shortly. There's a few things that I wanna bring to your attention. Um, on page three of the agenda package is the director's report. So I'll be reading off of that. Moving uh, down to number three, Space Coast TPO call for projects. Our transportation subcommittee met in January to kick off the project priorities program. We conducted our annual call for projects uh, solicitation and applications are due to the TPO by March 15th. These are transportation projects that are looking for state and federal funding. So for our new members, this is really one of the most important things that we do. Uh, moving on to uh, number four, um, if you did not make the TPO board and committee member orientation in January, you can still view uh, the webinar at your convenience. The link is provided in the agenda package, and it's just a one hour session, very high level overview, but it really does set the foundation of what you will be doing as a member. And I would highly encourage um, taking that hour out of the day to, to watch it. Uh, we would very much appreciate it. And also just to let you know, we will be uh, conducting quarterly transportation Thursday meetings and just highlighting some different topics, whether it is intelligent transportation system, uh, we're gonna have a topic on funding potentially. We have various topics laid out throughout the year and we think that those will be very helpful and educational as we move forward. Also in your agenda, <clears throat> on each item sheet, there is a staff contact that is responsible for that particular agenda item. So as we, um, as you review your agenda package prior to coming to the meeting, feel free to email or call them if you have any questions. And of course, you can always call me anytime. Um, you know, you are our Citizens Advisory Committee members and your questions, comments, and feedback is extremely important to this process. So we just wanna make sure that you have access to us anytime you may need us. The MPOAC met on January the 28th um, in Orlando. And so that is the Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council, which is of course the forum of the 27 MPOs, TPOs in the state of Florida. Um, and we meet to really discuss policy um, as a coalition. There were a few items discussed that I feel like I need to bring to your attention. Uh, President Biden, of course, announced the American uh, Rescue Plan, which provided $89 million uh, available to TMAs, that is Transportation Management Areas of Florida. And this is where there's an urbanized area with a population of 200,000 or more. And of course, the Space Coast TPA, TPO is an urbanized, uh, excuse me, a TMA. So funds are coming from general revenue. Um, they are more flexible than usual um, than the federal transportation funds. The apportionment tables shows that our TPO will receive roughly around 2.8 million in additional funding. Um, and these funds are available for obligation through fiscal year 2024. So that is all the information we have at this time. We, we don't know what the guidelines are or the rules um, for this, but we will keep you posted um, as we uh, learn more about this particular funding. There was also a lot of discussion um, that maybe uh, this summer there will be a relief package that will focus on infrastructure specifically, and perhaps a new reauthorization bill to focus on policy separately. Um, of course, it's all speculation, but you know, perhaps a replacement for the motor fuel tax will be tackled in a, uh, a new reauthorization bill, because as you know, we're still under the FAST Act, which has been extended uh, into September 30th of this year. Um, Finally, in your package, you have the MPOAC legislative newsletter. And of course, the, they monitor transportation related bills on behalf of all of the MPOs in Florida. 
And as those updates come out, we, we will make sure that we email them to you so that you can be aware of any changes. They are um, logging the changes in red so you don't have to read through the whole you know, uh, package of bills. You can just see very quickly what changes uh, are on the horizon. Um, the one thing I do want to mention, um, keeping our eye on Senate Bill 62, which would remove regional planning commissions from state statutes. And, you know, as you know, we work with the East, East Central Florida Regional Planning Council on special projects. Um, they are also responsible for securing grant funding for all of our cities and counties. They do a lot for um, all of us on a regional basis. So we want to stand firm with our regional planning councils, and we're really not sure completely what this is about. Um, so we are going to ask uh, our TPO on Thursday that uh, we send a letter um, opposing the bill, and we will be discussing that with the governing board um, this Thursday. Um, the TAC this morning passed a motion to support the TPO sending a letter urging the legislature to not pass Senate Bill 62 unless it is modified, you know, really to remove the regional planning, removal of the regional planning councils. So I did want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, we're going to monitor that very closely. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention um, at the bottom of page three is the recap of the October 8th uh, governing board action items. And of course, in your package, you have the draft CAC meeting minutes of October 5th and the draft governing board meeting minutes of October 8th. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Georgia. Anna. Uh, before we get to the consent agenda items, uh, I'd like to call for a, for a uh, See if we have a motion to uh, to consent with the TAC's motion to oppose Senate Bill 62 as written. Second. Motion by David Miller, uh, second by Adam Kohler. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Georgiana. Thank uh, you. And next up is the uh, consent, uh, consent agenda. Uh, which will be passed in one motion. Uh, do we have any items that uh, are pulled from the consent agenda? Yeah, this for everyone. I know there's only so many microphones to go around and for purposes of the minutes and so everyone virtually can hear, if you would just uh, pass the microphone around to whoever's speaking. Okay, I could have had a bigger mouth. <laughs> That's okay, Pete. Uh, but, but anyway, when I was reading the legislative news letter, I see there's a big push for electric vehicles. And, and then with GM's recent announcement that they're going to go full electric on passenger vehicles and SUVs by 2035, it's happening quick. But the only reason I'm mentioning it is I use my ears when I'm walking and riding a bike, and I don't see any mention at all about how they're, may, how they're going to make these quiet vehicles, because electric is, doesn't, uh, there's no sound. When I hear a car coming in back of me, I, I start paying attention, but there's no mention, and I'm just bringing it out front that as we start going full electric on the vehicles, uh, stop, look, and listen. We've got to incorporate a listen into the electric vehicles so we can be aware of them. And that's just a comment and that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Uh, that's an excellent point. As, as electric vehicles become more and more popular, uh, you know, uh, legislatures, uh, you know, both state and, and, and nationally are gonna have to look at, at uh, some kind of uh, safety protocols for, uh, to affect, you know, affecting uh, electric vehicles. It's a good point. Okay, uh, moving on, if there's nothing else, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, is, uh, do we have any items pulled from the consent agenda? Do we have anything virtually? No. All right, so the consent agenda will, will be passed in one motion and I will read aloud uh, every item on the consent agenda. Uh, the first item is our, uh, citizen, our uh, uh, Citizens Advisory uh, Committee meeting minutes from October 5th, 2020. 
Uh, next is the uh, approval of the 2021 Space Coast TPO meeting calendar, which is on uh, page 39 of, uh, of your uh, agenda packets. Uh, next up is uh, approval of uh, resolution 21-12, uh, the 2021 safety performance measures. And I'll read that. Uh, in moving uh, in 2012, the Moving Ahead for Progress Act, MAP 21, was authorized for federal service transportation funding. A key change in this act was the introduction of nationwide transportation performance measures and target setting for system performance. The current Highway Act, Fixing America's Surface Transportation, or FAST Act, continues the measuring of performance in federal highway, has established rules and guidelines for states and TPO MPOs to meet this requirement. Part of this process requires states and TPO MPOs to set performance targets for safety, planning, sister performance, bridge condition, and pavement conditions. In October 2018, the TPO Governing Board adopted the FDOT targets for each of these performance measures. The safety performances measure and its targets, however, must be readopted annually per federal highway requirements. Staff is recommending to continue supporting the FDOT uh, safety targets of zero fatalities and zero serious injuries for 2021, which is consistent with the board's adoption of the Vision Zero Action Plan in October 2020. Next is the uh, resolution 21-13, uh, Public Transportation Safety Action Plan, which is on page 45. Uh, the uh, 2021 Public Transportation Safety Action Plan. Safety performance measures for public transportation and transit are established via the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, the PTASP. Federal Transit Administration, FTA, published the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan final rule, which requires certain operators of public transportation systems that receive federal funds via FTA's urbanized area formula grants to develop safety plans. TPO and MPOs are required to either adopt the targets established by the transit agency or their own. Per the attach, attached resolution, the SCTPO seeks adoption of the established targets as adopted by the Brevard County uh, Board of County Commissioners on December 8th, 2020. And there's a, there's a link if you wanna access it and look it up online. Next up is uh, is uh, work order 21-02T, the bus stop ADA training scope of services. And uh, the approval of the Brevard County Space Coast Area Transit Public Transportation uh, Agency Safety Plan 2020 and Safety Management System, SMAs. Framework and Implementation Guide. The Board of County Commissioners in regular session on December 8, 2020, executed and approved the PTASP 2020 and the SMS Framework Implementation Guide 2020. And uh, we have request to approve those. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda as, as provided. We have motion from Rochelle and a second from uh, Arlen. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Consent agenda is approved. Our first action plan is election of officers. Do we have any nominations or volunteers for chairman? <laughs> yeah. We have a nomination from Rochelle. Do we have a second or any other nominations? Second. second from Gil. Any other nominations? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you, board. Next up is the election of our vice chairman. Now, Tony Sasso is uh, no longer uh, on the board except for as an alternate. So we will need a new vice chairman. So do we have any nominations or volunteers? No, I'm more effective from the floor. <laughs> David? All right, David has volunteered. So uh, if there are no other volunteers, can I get a motion to uh, elect David as the vice chairman? 
We have a motion and a second from Adam. The motion was from Guy Tucker. All in favor say aye. Aye, all opposed. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. And so does the board. Uh, the second was uh, Adam, I believe, correct? Yeah, Adam yeah. Kohler. <laughs> okay, next up is uh, Sarah with our list of project uh, priorities, amendment number one. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Krom. I'm the senior transportation planner with the Space Coast TPO. We are bringing forth the first amendment to our fiscal year 21 list of project priorities. This is in regards to a project that's called the Parish Park Trailhead. It's up, up on the Ma Max Brewer Causeway in Titusville along the Coast to Coast Trail and the St. John's River to Sea Loop. It includes improved parking, drainage and some stable shore stabilization. The main purpose of the project is to kind of take that causeway area that right now is kind of like a sand parking lot and make it more of an established trailhead for both people that would like to use the trail as well as also for non-motorized boat users such as kayaks or canoes to access the Indian River Lagoon. The project was originally not on our priority list because it received federal lands access program funds or a flap grant and it does in order to receive those funds you do not have to be on the tpo priority list however now there are um overages within the project where they are seeking some additional funds so we need to put them on the priority list in order for them to seek those funds and so um with that i'll take any questions or if you would like to propose a motion all right do we have any questions pete yeah trailhead but you're delaying the trail <laughs> um <laughs> right uh, well i mean i i wouldn't say i'm delaying the trail no, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of that um, delaying the yeah this is a this is a very different funding source that is the the trail on the Marion island national wildlife refuge cannot receive federal transportation dollars once you cross that boundary so it is competing with different funds but uh, yeah it but you can you can head west well, you can head good. west about i think it's up well, to like 100 miles now no it's a good spot mm -hmm. to park and drink beer and fish and here's the moon yeah. all that build a trailhead that for no trail <laughs> well with the trail hey, but i hear you you, yeah. take, you take things when yeah. you can get them yeah yeah and and the trail to to the east is being delayed however at this point you can get completely through brevard county and through volusia county along at one cohe well there's like one gap in volusia that they're i was told they're very close to so it does serve you know that whole western section of trail well an update on volusia i saw survey stakes right there about four months ago mm -hmm. so when they start laying it out that means construction is soon to follow so they did purchase that land yeah for, that's what um i i ran into their parks director you know about a month ago and and he made it sound like it was imminent, that it was it was ready to go. So, yeah. well, good. <laughs> and now you can go all the way to Sanford, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, see, you could park in in downtown Titusville on the Parish Park, and then go all the way to Sanford. Park at the trailhead that has no trail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Great. any other, other questions, questions for Sarah? Seeing none, I'll uh, I'll entertain a motion. Can I get a motion, please? Kohler, yes. Motion to uh, approve. Motion from Adam. Do we have a second? Second from David. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All, uh, all opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Next up is the uh, Resolution 2111, the Project Funding Guidelines. Laura. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Carter, the Assistant Director of the Space Coast TPO. Um, today I'll be discussing a little bit of the guidelines that are listed in the resolution that is in your package. Um, these guidelines are um, formally uh, documenting what we have historically been doing when we coordinate with the Florida Department of Transportation when funding our project priorities. 
The reason why we are seeking a formal adoption today is to ensure consistency on how the different funding sources, especially the TPO's use of their SU funds, are used to program projects. Also, another benefit is over time as staffing changes within the DOT, um, local elections, or even within the TPO staff itself, there'll be a consistent approach applied across, um, over time as our projects take a long time to implement. So I'm going to start off with the largest pot of funding, and that is our funding used to uh, strategic enroll system. We are just requesting that we continue that the DOT utilize CIS revenues on CIS facilities. Other funds, such as the district dedicated revenues, our DDR and uh, surface transportation program SA funds, should be used to fund our major TPO projects. Transportation alternatives, as we refer to them as TA funds, we would like to continue to utilize having our BPAC committee to identify which projects to fund using the limited TA funds available as those types of projects, TA funds are applied to bicycle, pedestrian, and trails. All projects on our priority list should be considered for any creative funding opportunities though that may arise. This could be funding with uh, public-private partnerships, using the SIGB program or TRIP, our transportation regionally significant program. Moving on specifically to the surface transportation block grant funds, which we refer to as SU, is the one funding source that the TPO has the most control over and is most flexible also on what types of projects we can use SU funds on. According to federal regulations, the guidelines state that TPO shall consult with the state on which projects to place these types of funds on. Previously, our staff has been um, advised to finish what we have started and also to use these SU funds on off-system projects first. It does not mean that SU would not be placed on state roadways on system projects, but we would look to get projects that are not eligible for other types of funds first. So there are other times throughout the year that these SU funds become available and the DOT will call us up and ask us, where would you like us to put these funds? They could have arisen from um, previous projects coming in under budget. The DOT sometimes will do fund swaps to take advantage of different funding sources to leverage more dollars. And our um, staff is then faced with what projects do we put these on? Historically, as we mentioned, we try to finish what we have started. And they're typically not large sums of money, but these guidelines attached to this resolution just kind of clarify the direction that we should be continuing to do and to place them um, on current projects already in the pipeline before we start anything new with them. Obviously, the DOT should always consult with the TPO, executive director, or other um, designated staff prior to moving anything within the DOT work program. This is something that we want to make sure is done to ensure that the TPO's priorities is what is getting funded first. So again, today we're just asking for approval of Resolution 21-11, which is our project funding guidelines. I will mention now so that these guidelines have been established in a written procedure that staff does follow and has already been um, reviewed by our transportation subcommittee. And if at any time in the future, these guidelines need to be amended or you want to provide staff different direction, then we will bring them back for you for your consideration for any kind of amendments or updates. And with that, I ask for a motion for approval or I would answer any questions. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Laura or Shell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can you give me some examples of projects where you would assign the SU funds or some that you might have in mind for upcoming this year that, to put the SU funds on? I'm just curious. If something was to come available right now, we would have to look at the project priorities that, as they are right now, what's on our priorities and projects that already have something actively on them. Um, Ellis Road is a good example. That is a number one priority. Um, there are other roadways too. We would try to first stay away from state roads because state roads have other options, whereas projects that might be on, let's say, Babcock Street, certain sections of it that aren't state maintained, um, Malabar Road, Wickham Road, um, any of your off-system roadways, if we have projects that are ongoing right now, we would want to, and that they needed additional funding or could help move it up instead of in an outer year, but it has to be ready. 
And we also have to be aware, the other caveat is, is a lot of these off system um, projects, if we put federal funds on them, the local agency that is maintaining it has to be able to administer it by the LAP program. So some of your smaller entities, there may be a project in the pipeline that's off system, they may be ready, but whoever is going to administer it by LAP has to have the staff, the resources, and already be LAP certified by the department before we could do that. So that, that, that's, it, there's a lot of little small caveats when the funding becomes available. We say, yay, great, but we got to go through a whole checklist. We start with the priority list, what's ready, what can take it right now. Um, I know that the intelligent transportation system has benefited greatly from these small pockets of money that comes through. We typically will run to Stephen and say, hey, is there a, an ITS project that the district can use these funds? And we'll give them to the district contract DOT and have them administer it and we can move ITS projects forward, which is really a good bang for the buck because then we don't have to have the locals administer through LAP. The district can do it for us and the public can sometimes see that re, um, return more quickly through more traffic signalization cooperation. Does that answer you. your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Laura. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, uh, quick. Uh, Greg, would you uh, grab that microphone? Would someone pass that microphone? Thank you. Yeah, I see uh, SIS funds, SU funds, TA funds, uh, and I'm sure there's some other pots of money. There's about 400 fund codes. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. We can have a class. Uh, on on like. the couple that I mentioned mm -hmm. that, that you have listed in your attachment, a, maybe percentage-wise, what are we looking at? Uh, between the couple? That is very difficult to say. That ranges from year to year how much funding is actually available. I can tell you SU annually, the TPO gets around five to six million dollars is what it's running right now. Um, that could be changed in the future um, with COVID. Not sure how the future years are going to come. Your CIS is in the millions. Um, I mean, I'd have to refer to DOT. They're responsible for funding those programs with CIS dollars. TA is only 500 Four to five hundred thousand dollars a year is your transportation alternatives. That's why I mentioned going through the BPAC. That's really for your smaller projects. I think we funded um, John Rhodes. Is that John Rhodes? Aurora Sidewalk and Coco. There's a few small where we usually fill in gaps with those funding. So each funding source is unique in itself. And as Georgiana mentioned, those transportation Thursdays that we're going to be doing, funding comes up a lot. It gets go down the rabbit hole and I could probably spend the entire afternoon up here talking about it. But um, we definitely will. If you have questions again in more detail, we can okay. talk afterwards. So, so basically what, what you've told me is SIS, SU, and then TA. Boom. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Laura? Do we have any virtual questions, Sarah? No? Okay, in that case, I'll entertain a motion, please. Move we approve resolution 21 Motion from Greg. Do we have a second? Second from Arlen, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye, all opposed, all opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to our FDOT tentative five-year work program, Georgiana. Georgiana, are you there? Ah, okay. Well, um, Catherine's going to handle this one. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon. Yep, I'm Kathy Alexander, program management administrator of District Five. And I'm here to present to you all our tentative work program for the upcoming five years, fiscal years 22. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Switch is right. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking loud. Can you hear me now? Much better? All right. Sorry about that. I could yell, but this helps. Again, Kathy Alexander, Program Management Administrator at District 5, and I'm here to present the tentative work program for fiscal years 22 through 26. So our work program is a representation of the transportation needs for the upcoming five years. And that includes projects that are, are involved public transit, seaport, airport, and rail projects, as well as transportation planning, transportation systems management operations, engineering and design, right of way and construction act activities. Now DOT identifies the needs along with the priorities that are provided by the TPO and our local agencies. 
And in the case of public transit seaport airport and rail projects, we are not the lead, but we do identify those projects in our work program through collaboration with those representative agencies. Um, we do monitor our work program in terms of fiscal year. So our fiscal year runs from July 1st until June 30th of the following year. So when we're talking about fiscal year 22, that will start July of this year and will go until June 30th of 2022. The program areas where we have projects represented in our work program are safety and security, system preservation and maintenance, pedestrian and bicycle enhancements, multimodal enhancements, operational improvements, and capacity improvements. Um, in terms of the SIS or the state strategic systems, those are projects based on the needs of the department as well as the priorities identified by the TPO. There are other activities that are included in our work program, and that could be feasibility studies, it could be tra uh, traffic studies, as well as emergency and isolated repairs. This graphic gives you a representation of how we developed our, our tentative work program. Right now, we are working on our adopted work program. So the adopted work program is after it has been reviewed and approved. Um, our adopted work program represents fiscal years 21 through 25. That first year is considered the lockdown year, and that is set for budgetary purposes. So if there's any changes to the lockdown, it may require approval from Tallahassee. So every year we venture into the process of developing a new tentative work program. And that means that we develop a new fifth year, the projects in the first year are complete, and everything shifts over to the left. So now we have, again, five-year tentative work program. And it represents the needs for each of those years in the upcoming five-year plan. So this is our tentative work program fiscal years 22 to 26, and it will remain tentative until it is approved in July. Um, that is when it becomes adopted July 1st of this year. Um, a lot goes into developing your tentative work program, but it is subject to change. You'll see here different activities that contribute to the development of our tentative work program. Again, everything kicks off on July 1st when we become adopted. That is also when we receive the priority list from the TPOs. Um, we also do all of the coordination and the collaboration with the local partners to identify the needs, uh, the priorities, anything that's going to be needed in that tentative work program, as well as the department needs are identified. We review what the programs and the targets are. A key activity that occurs every year is the revenue estimating conference. There happen to be two for this development cycle, one in August and one in December. And the importance to that is that's where we receive the revenue information and the allocations for how we can build our plan. So basically, how do we meet our targets and our needs against the resources available? Unfortunately, this year we were faced with the challenge that the projections and the revenues anticipated for this work program were less, were about $1.4 billion short. Um, and our projections were not on target what we were thinking. So we were faced with the challenge of how are we going to meet all the needs and the balance to finalize plan. Another difficult task that we had this year is that this information was not made available to the department until November. Typically, we get this information in September and we're able to review everything. It was late this year. So it actually took us right up to the snapshot date that you see there of December 18th, which is what was used for our public hearing information of our work program. That public hearing was held the second week of January, and there was also a time period there for any kind of public comments for the public record. As we progress for getting our tentative uh, work program reviewed and approved, there's a couple of more activities that will take place. We have the February 12th date coming up, which is the deadline for TPO written objections. We also have the Florida Transportation, Transportation Commission, which will review the tentative work program, and that's the whole for the state for all the districts. That'll be a workshop. The date is still to be determined. And then the actual the tentative work program is submitted to the Office of the Governor for review and also for the legislature, which begins March 2nd, ends April 30th, ultimately making its way to adoption on July 1st. I talked a little bit about some of those funding challenges that we received news of from the revenue estimating conferences. Um, we were seeing reductions in revenue as well as forecasts. A lot of factors were involved, but one of the key ones is the reduction of gas consumption we're seeing more enhancements in fuel efficiency. The gentleman, you made a comment to electric vehicles. That obviously means there's less gas being purchased. Vehicles are riding longer on mileage per gallon. So that is affecting our revenue stream. We're also seeing increases in right away with the real estate prices up 7.1%, which that's also affecting the cost of our projects. 
And then lastly, we have the economic impacts of the pandemic um, with people working from home. Again, less people on the roadway, less people purchasing gas. Again, and also a hit to any revenues that we may have from gas tax. I mentioned there was an overall statewide deficit of 1.4 plus billion for the district. We were seeing a hundred million dollar shortage for our upcoming five year that we were developing. And we had shortages of four out of the five years. So it was $80 million in the current year and then everything else was kind of spread in the upcoming four. So we were faced with the task or how are we gonna be able to balance our needs? And we had to set some priorities. Um, a couple of those priorities are one, we wanna make sure that we were still holding true to any existing contracts that we had. We also were holding true to any debt service payments that were required and maintain all of our preservation and maintenance projects. If we needed to affect projects, we wanted to make sure that we were offsetting those uh, um, the funding maybe across several years to help out with that balancing. And if we had to defer, keep it within a year or two of deferrals. So impact as least as possible. What you see here is the breakdown or the actual allocation of funding for Brevard County. Um, we have an overall $4.9 billion for the department. And for Brevard County, you're seeing here across the years, a total of almost $900 million in projects. Here you have a breakdown for the type of projects where the, the funding is being um, represented. We have safety, capacity, preservation. So this would be like your bridge repairs, um, lanes, lane resurfacing. We have multimodal, we have operations, we have bike ped, and then miscellaneous, which could be anything that's independent. Do you do questions now or at the end? Uh, when we do it at the end, great. All right. All right, moving on to project highlights then, I'll just go ahead and highlight some of the priority projects for the TPO that do have funding represented in our attentive work program. We'll start off with some capacity improvements. Here you have St. John's Heritage Parkway, Ellis Road, John Rhodes Boulevard to west of Wickham Road. This is a widening project and we have right of way activities that are um, programmed for fiscal years 22 through 26. Another capacity improvement project, State Road 528, east of State Road 524, Industry Road to east of State Road 3. Again, right of way activities are programmed fiscal years 24 to 26. Another 528 project east of State Road 3 to Port Canaveral Interchange. This is also widening with right of way program 24 through 26. We have a bridge replacement project, the Nassau Causeway Bridge. This has construction in fiscal year 22. Space Commerce Way, Nassau Parkway to Kennedy Parkway. This again is also a construction that we have programmed in the upcoming year, fiscal year 22. Couple of operational improvement projects, including this one, State Road 500, US 192, a Hollywood Boulevard. They're adding some turn lanes. Here we have design starting in 22. There's right away 22 to 24, and construction is planned for 24. State Road A1A, this is some miscellaneous construction. We have right away activities planned for fiscal years 22 through 26, and construction in 25. Another operational improvement project where we're adding turn lanes. This is in Wickham Road at I-95 ramps. They're also doing improvements there to the mast arms, to the traffic signals. Here we have construction in fiscal year 22. Traffic signal improvements at State Road 518 at Wickham Road. Construction for this one is fiscal years 23. Couple of ITS, Intelligent Transportation System Improvements. This is for NASA Boulevard. This one has design in the upcoming year, fiscal year 22. Another ITS operational improvement, ITS communication system. This is an operations project that is planned for fiscal years 22 through 26. Moving on to bike path and trails. Um, here we have the Space Coast Trail, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge to Playa Linda parking lot. Here we have environmental activities that are programmed in fiscal year 23. We have a sidewalk improvement project. This is along State Road A1A from Ugali Boulevard to Volunteer Way. The right of way for this is planned for fiscal years 22 through 24. 
another sidewalk improvement project along NASA Boulevard from Gateway Drive to Eddie Allen Road. And this has construction planned for fiscal years 24. And I mentioned some of the decisions that were made in order to balance the work program. This was one of the projects. This was a construction that was deleted from fiscal year 22, but this was really due to adjustments to the funding that was associated to the project for SunTrail was the funding source on that. Um, they did retain the environmental activities, but construction is being delayed until they can work that out. And that concludes my presentation. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay, Greg, you had a question? This did. This was the revenue and allocations that we received at the end of last year. So yeah, our revenue, the revenue reductions are represented in this tentative work program. Abs we're hoping. We're all hoping. Okay. Pete. Uh, Kathy, looking at the numbers for Bavard County, looking at the numbers for Bavard County, it seems like every year they take a bigger and bigger hit. In three years, we're close to one half the money that we have this year. And then it seems to increase at five years. Uh, first, are these cuts prorated across all the construction offices in the district or is Brevard County getting a harder hit than other areas? It's not, a, it's not across all districts. It depends on the funding that is available. Some of that revenue and allocations is what's provided from the Revenue Estimating Conference. So there isn't a direct reduction across the counties. Okay, so it's not a balancing act. It's This is just what we're getting here, regardless of how much money is out there. There is some of it. And we do run what's known as a fair share report. So we have to review that to see how much is being allocated to each of the counties. So that is part of building the tentative work program is that there is representation across the counties. So we, it, 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 regardless of the money coming in, this would be our share based on the work we have coming up. And then well, another point I want to make is the district has been aware, and the DOT has been aware that gas tax revenue have been decreasing at least for 12 years that I know of, and they've made no effort at all to compensate for the decreases in gas taxes. Do they have any plan to address it now that is getting critical? It's definitely a common response. I think it is a focus for a lot of individuals as they're discussing is how to fund the transportation needs for the state moving forward. Well, the big news is General Motors announced completely electric all cars and all SUVs by 2035. Mm -hmm. That's in 14 years. And then by 2040, all electric, no more internal combustion engines. So this has gotten from critical to dire emergency you know, with electric vehicles not being a crystal ball, but being a reality. I mean, the rubber is already hitting the road. Is the department making any plans to address this or are they just dozing around like we read in the report? Oh, SUVs are eating our money. We got to do some. I mean, where is it at? Where's the thinking going? No, there's definitely discussions on how to be able to absorb some of those decreases that we're seeing from the gas. There needs to it needs to come from somewhere else. So those discussions are ongoing. I can't tell you what the specifics no, I, are. No, I understand. I'm ragging yeah. and I know you don't have answers. I'm pulling yeah. your chain because this is so sudden. It's, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't expect GM to make an announcement like that. Last I knew they were with President Trump going against California on the mission standards. Now, for them to make a radical turn like that, I mean, that's a surprise, but it's here and it's something that has to be dealt with. And I just throwing it out there that something has to be done. And you hear talking to us about money. Well, the money is going to get less and less as more and more electrical vehicles hit the streets. And that's a reality that's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some well, these numbers might even be high. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I understand. Yeah, that's something that really needs to be addressed at the legislature. Any other questions? David. More of a comment than a question. Kind of springboarding off of what Pete said, it's sort of like the slide rule. It's going, the fossil fuel is going to be decreasing over time, but energy will never decrease. 
So I, I recommend if my voice has an impact, is to roll the gas tax into more of an energy tax and get rid of the gas tax completely. I, Just a comment. I appreciate it. I'm sure there's all kinds of scenarios coming across on how we can offset some of those shortfalls. Rochelle. Thank you. I'm just curious why the drop in 24, 25. What what is that a function of? We would have to look and see. I would have to look and see the numbers. So I don't have it right off of the top of my head. It could be maybe major projects that were in one year versus the other, because that is the numbers in whole. So we can go back and see, you know, which major project is taking place in one year versus the other, and that's where that drop is coming okay, from. Thanks. I was just curious. Um, we can find out for you. Mr. Chair, if I if I may kind of add on what Catherine just said, um, you know, looking at this five-year outlook, what I see in fiscal year 22, that's such a large number, of course, you know, it being the first year of the work program, but it's also the when the uh, infrastructure grant was um, received for the NASA Causeway Bridge, which was huge. I mean, we don't normally get that kind of money on a project. So that's not state money, that's USDOT money uh, coming into Brevard County. So that is quite a huge number. Um, and of course, this is basically just a snapshot of our tip. And so, you know, as we submit projects to DOT, that just happens to be the projects that they fund in those specific years. Um, but I'll wait to, and to, I would like to make some, some comments if I may, uh, are there any other, um, questions to Catherine before I begin? Yeah. Anyone have any other questions? Did we have any virtual questions, Sarah? No, you have the floor, Georgiana. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things I wanted to first, you should have at your place, um, a handout, which is labeled item 7A which are comments that we submitted online. As you know, the DOT did have their online public hearing uh, from January the 11th to the 15th, and anyone can get online, look at the work program and, and submit comments. So I did wanna take the opportunity, one, to just thank them, uh, thank the district for their partnership and the collaboration, because I tell you, it, it's definitely been a very difficult year. Um, you know, we've had some, uh, uh, we've had some uncertain times for sure. And quite frankly, I think the carnage could have been a lot worse uh, with the work program impacts that we've had. So it, you know, the Space Coast Trail, having that funding deleted for construction, it certainly hurts because it is the number one priority for the Central Florida MPO Alliance on their trail list. And so, we do plan on um, giving the TPO uh, an objection letter uh, to submit to DOT, but we understand that something has got to come out and, and we are uh, sure that the department is looking at the fair share report and making sure that any sort of um, uh, reductions are done across the board and one in MPO area is not getting hit harder than the other. Um, I also wanted to mention and thank the department for the A1A project that Catherine mentioned at International Drive intersection and the, then the sidewalk to Long Point Road. And Catherine, I noticed you called it a sidewalk project, but really it's a lot more than that. And I didn't pick up on it when you presented to the technical committee, but it is the intersection of International Drive, the realignment of that intersection and then the sidewalk going all the way to Long Point Road. And that has been a top priority for Cape Canaveral for many years. And so I think that is a very important multimodal project to just improve safety uh, in the Cape Canaveral area. I mentioned, you know, the, the NASA Causeway, the Infrastructure Grant, Space Commerce Way. We couldn't be more appreciative for all the work that the department has uh, put in working with Space Florida and NASA to develop that term sheet. You know, we always, all of the members know that, you know, there's strings attached with federal money. Well, when you apply for a USDOT grant, um, it, it takes it to another level. And so we're just very appreciative of all the work that the department did to deliver that. And now the money is showing up in the DOT work program, which is excellent. 
And I'll just, you know, end by saying, you know, we, we look forward to working with the department on getting the construction of Ellis Road uh, fully funded. That is our number one priority. And, um, and then, of course, if you remember back in September, um, we had the big presentation on the 528 causeway. We want to ensure that we secure that additional two and a half million in CIS funding to update the design of the 528 widening so that they can extend the 528 bridge over the Banana River, allowing for the opportunity of causeway removal in the future. That was the, the position that the board took, the TPO governing board, and so we are hopeful that they can find those funds and we can get that design uh, taken care of. And with that, that concludes my comments. Okay, thank you, Georgiana. Uh, any other questions for Kathy? Peter. Uh, Kathy, Georgiana, she cleaned up the money because I take that 126 million out of facial year, this facial year, and that gets us down to 132 million and then the numbers make more sense. And uh, I'd like to tell everybody here that Georgiana, when she says she's responsive in the TPO, I've sent emails out on Sunday, not expecting answers until later. Well, I get a response back on Sunday. That's from Kim and that's from Georgiana. So, you know, these people that are really on top. If they take the time to respond on the Sunday, that speaks worlds and volumes of how serious they take their jobs. And thank you for the response, Georgiana. Okay, any other thank questions you, or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay, next up is our uh, bike ped uh, and uh, trails advisory committee report, Sarah. So this is a presentation actually on our bicycle and pedestrian master plan that was adopted in October 2019. If you believe it or not, we've had a whole year since, well, more than a year now since we updated our bicycle pedestrian master plan. And we thought it'd be nice to come back and give you guys an update on what we were able to accomplish over that year from our, our bicycle pedestrian master plan. Because we want our master plans to be impactful, effective, living documents that really can make progress in our community. <clears throat> so if you recall, um, we established five goals for the Bike Pen Master Plan. Um, you should have a handout in your agenda package. That's kind of a one page or summary that condenses everything in the PowerPoint. Um, and so I'm just gonna walk through the five goals and discuss some of the objectives and progress that were, that were made over the past year. Yes. This is uh, as good a place as any that I want to make this comment for our beloved mid-block crosswalks <laughs> on A1A. Uh, lowering the speed limit there has certainly helped mm -hmm. tremendously, although a lot of us, uh, the residents, don't like it. But my problem, it's not really engineering, but it, those of you have had the pro have had the privilege of coming up to one of these crosswalks, they have a little sign about this wide uh, the gate it's on the spring and there's one on each side and it's a narrow road to begin with and these poor signs suffer a life and death struggle every week <laughs> uh, the surface gets beat up they plop over if you hit them with the car but eventually they disappear and they have to be uh, i guess replaced my problem though is not that but i have a lot of experience with the crosswalk all times of day these things are distracting um, you find yourself aiming for the roadway to avoid the little flippy flops <laughs> while you're concentrating on that you might run over a pedestrian <laughs> I, they they I, I just would like someone to to maybe take a look at how effective or non-effective these are, because to me, they distract the driver, and that's exactly what we don't need to do 
at a pedestrian crosswalk. I think that's some great feedback, Mr. Miller, that, you know, um, FDOT is in the room. We can also take it back to them. As you know, Mr. DeBlau is well aware of, we've been working with, or rather Cocoa Beach has been work discussing with FDOT and bringing up the mid blocks more and more because they had some proposal um, regarding the mid blocks. So I think it's definitely a longer conversation that that we need to keep having to to improve that area and 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 figure out what what is the best way to to improve the pedestrian safety on A1A. And I think I, mean, I can understand the reasoning point. maybe at the beginning, but you don't want to distract the driver. Yeah. And yeah. I find myself this is just for me. I end up concentrating more <laughs> on getting between those two signs than I do if there are any pedestrians. There. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Sarah, I think Kim had something she wanted to address. Personally, I would appreciate maybe if we could hold this conversation for the local government report, because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole yeah. for a half hour talking about this and focus on the agenda item at hand. Okay, and thank you, Jordana. Come up and respond. All right, thank you, Mr. Miller and, and Laura. Um, all right, so bike ped master plan. Um, we have our five goals. The first one is create a network, which is establish a well-connected, safe and comfortable bicycle and pedestrian network. One of our performance measures for that goal was, and this is within five years, plan, design, or construct four miles of additional bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Within the first year, we already surpassed that. We had 7.24 miles of pro projects that had some sort of progress made on it, whether it completed design and it, it received extra or additional funding for the next phase. Um, some of the highlights are the NASA Boulevard sidewalk, the John Road sidewalk for those that are in or around Melbourne. That it was just, it was this awful situation where there's a cattle path where constantly pedestrians are walking along the road. And so um, the design was completed and this past year and we'll be seeing it constructed in this coming year. Um, so just some really great projects that the BPAC as well as our committees and our governing board have been able to make an impact to our bicycle and pedestrian community. <clears throat> some other things that I believe are noteworthy is there are four resurfacings um, with improvements that were under design last year that had bicycle pedestrian improvements that we were able to work with FDOT to incorporate. One of those was Fisk Boulevard, which is now under construction. I drive through it every day and it's the happiest construction I've ever driven through because I get to see a sidewalk being built where there really needed to have been a sidewalk. We also have made some progress on our showcase and regional trails. We adopted the new trail alignment with the Indian River MPO, as well as also we, we hosted 16 regional trail meetings last year. And so that really goes to show you know, how, how committed we are to developing the regional trail system with Sun Trails FDUT and all of our local partners. <clears throat> next, next goal is partner with organizations, which is partner to educate, enforce, and engineer safe use of facilities. Kim and Abby do an absolutely wonderful job of this. Last year, they did have some impacts due to COVID. However, they were still able to conduct two really large events with Operation Vision Zero in February 2020 and Stop on Red event on August 2020. They've continued involvement with community traffic safety team. Kim completed the Vision Zero action plan at our last meeting in October and um, also conducted 12 safety classes slash events at schools. Empower, empower people of all ages and abilities to walk or ride bicycle regularly. We held eight trail focused webinars through the St. John's River to Sea Loop virtual summit. It was originally supposed to be a three-day three day in-person summit um, right at the end of March. So we, we had to very quickly turn that around and we actually ended up probably having a larger reach where we even had people out of state attend these webinars. We also completed eight school routes analysis that produced already two school safe routes to school applications that were submitted last year. Generate awareness, increase awareness of the network, safe practices, and public health benefits. We finalized initial mapping of the facilities through the process of developing the plan. So we now have really great GIS files of the presence and absence of bicycle pedestrian trail projects. The North Provide Wayfinding Plan was funded 
in fiscal year 2021 to 2023 unified planning work program. That scope will actually come to you in March. And we were able to present our bicycle pedestrian master plan to five municipalities and the Rivard Sustainability, Rivard Sustainability Working Group. I wanted to be able to stand up here this year and say we presented or discussed with every single municipality in Brevard County. Um, we were in the process of scheduling all those when March came around last year and really kind of put a break on, on the discussions because we, we felt like they, they really would have been more valuable having one-on-one -on -one, you know, discussions face-to-face -face, and now we've decided to incorporate it into a larger municipal program where we'll go out and actually discuss all of our plans. All right, Pursue Equity is our last one, and that is Pursue Equitable Distribution of Projects, Programs, and Funding. We began an internal conversation to develop an educational engagement program for marginalized or disadvantaged communities, really trying to tap in, make sure that they're, we're, we're involving every, we're equitably involving everyone in our process. Um, we've continued meetings with municipalities on ADA bus stop improvements, Terry is, from SCAT is such a wonderful person to work with in getting us out there and able to have these conversations with the municipalities and getting things done, um, and which he'll tell you a little bit more about some of the projects that he's been working on during the transit report. Um, the development of, and then we finalized the development of our new project prioritization methodology completed in March 2020. So we were able to kind of intertwine aspects of multimodal equity within so that methodology. So the COVID-19 impacts that we saw to um, the implementation of our bicycle pedestrian master plan was there was a, a sharp decrease in community and school events. Um, you, Kim had 12 school events last year, but normally that number is much, much larger. Um, we had an increase in online engagement and education. I It has been absolutely amazing to watch just our attendance to things increase by double and triple fold um, just because we put it online and made it accessible during during the global pandemic so we've continued to do that and seen increases um, increase in use and interest of bicycle and pedestrian facilities it seems like a whole lot of people got bored sitting at home and rediscovered walking and biking and i'm glad to see it's continued even after things have begun to open up and then, of course, as we just saw with the FDOT work program, the potential for funding impacts. So with that, I'll take any questions regarding the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan Progress Report. Yeah, any, any questions for Sarah specific to the progress report? We'll continue that discussion on the local <laughs> report. Pete? Very specific. Um, four or five years ago, I asked, do we have a map where I could go online and click? Mm -hmm. And that's what you're alluding to, is that the initial data is in. And the next phase is where we can go online with our, if we come visit Brevard County, we got a couple mm -hmm. of bikes on the back of the trailer. We can click, where can I go put these bikes on the trail mm -hmm. and it's going to show up. And me, that's, and that's where we're going, right? Me and Chelsea are trying. We're, we're, we're working on it. Well, the trails are growing. So yeah, yeah you know, yeah. as soon as you get done, you're going to have to we're update. We're going to have to update. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and, and you mentioned the increase in bicycles mm -hmm. well when we hit the state parks in the winter because it's half price for geezers we used to take our bicycles and feel pretty lonely mm -hmm. uh, this year everybody had a bike yeah uh, it, you know so you're mm -hmm. right it it is it is in a really really increasing bicycle mm -hmm. use going out enjoying yourself and enjoying the outdoors i'm glad to see it and i hope it continues me too thank you Pete. Okay, thank you, Pete. Adam, you had something? Board members, can I talk about that now? Yeah. I, excuse me. Wait, want me to wait? Uh, let's wait till the, till the local government report. Thank you. Any any other questions for Sarah? Do we have any virtual okay. questions? No. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, public engagement report, uh, Abby. Um, yeah. We need to go back. Because, uh, we are on. It's confusing because there's two bike bicycle. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and then you don't get out of there. You got to go back. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right, moving on then to our FDOT report. Good 
Good afternoon. Is this on? Yeah. Good afternoon, Anna Taylor, FDOT. Um, I just wanted to make you all aware that we have made some changes to the construction reports in your agendas in hopes that they're a little bit easier to read, more friendly to use. Um, if you guys have any comments or would like to see anything different, we'd love your feedback. Um, at this time, we don't have any public meetings planned for the next month in your area. Um, should that change, we'll be happy to let you know. Um, and that concludes my report. Well, that was quick. Any questions before you leave? Well, she, she, uh, she asked for some feedback. So I used to read the reports where they were line items. Uh, it had the uh, uh, project manager's name and the CEI and pretty much worthless, you know, unless you knew what was we going felt on. Yeah. So, so you're asking, is there improvement between where you can actually read and see what's going on and yes, just sir. look at light line items and be in total confusion? Yes, sir. I don't think you even need to ask that question. <laughs> We thought so too. It was actually more of an internal document. And so we made some adjustments to make it more of an external document that's easier to read. Well, you've been dumping in on us for years and you're calling it internal. No, but this is a big improvement. Uh, nice to see it happening where you can look and actually see what's going on. Thank you. Adam? Yes, thank you. You said that there is nothing scheduled in the foreseeable future foreseeable future just for the next Thank month you. between now and your next board meeting we do not have any public meetings planned can you give us a, an idea of what's coming up the following month um i can i i don't have that on hand but i can next, next month and you try to have two, two two months instead of one yeah that's no problem any other questions or comments for anna okay thank you anna thank you okay moving back uh, to sarah All right, so now the BPAC report. All right, so um, the BPAC met on January 25th. You have a summary within your agenda on the item sheet. Just to quickly go over, it was a lot of administrative items, seeing as it was our first meeting of the new year. So, um, you know, the meeting calendar, we elected our new officers. So our new chair is Angelica Keene with UF IFAS Extension. She is a um, health educator, so community health educator, so really great person to have aboard. And our vice chair is Alan Woolwich with Housing and Human Services. <laughs> um, we adopted our 2021 BPAC action plan, which kind of just outlines all, all the items that the BPAC hopes to accomplish during that year. We approved the BPAC award nominations, which will be presented to our board in March. They received the same presentation you just received. And then we're starting a new program called Member Showcase. So as you know, we live in a long, thin county, and we all kind of have this tendency to get stuck in our bubble. I live in Rockledge, and I work in Vieira, and pretty much I don't leave that bubble um, unless I have to. And so the we, we decided to develop this Member Showcase with the opportunity for the members to share their favorite trail or their favorite bike route or their favorite sidewalk or maybe a place that is lacking a trail bike lane or has some sort of pedestrian or bicycle issue. Um, so basically they were able to showcase to the rest of the, the members something that was happening in their community. So that hopefully, you know, if you live up in, if the Titusville representative probably doesn't know too much about what's going on in Malabar, Grand Valkyria and vice versa. And so it can really be a way for them to communicate more effectively the the issues and the the progress that's being made without our county with bicycle pedestrian trails so um that's all i have to report with the bpac today if anyone has any questions repeat yeah can you expand on the bicycle trailers will be delivered this week to the participating schools what are you giving them kids kim can you expand on um the bicycle pedestrian tra or the bi bicycle trailers yeah i mean that sounds neat i just like to <laughs> more information on it well actually they're at so, fun school this week <laughs> so for the 21 plus years that i've well 21 years i've been at the tpo and even before that we have bicycle trailers that if a teacher goes through the state approved curriculum they can sign out for a period of three to four weeks at a time and we've gone from one trailer to now we currently operate five trailers that so the the pe teachers can can sign those out and they teach uh bicycle safety, pedestrian safety, right in the PE classes. So you supply 
bicycles and the trailer. And helmets. And so, uh, so you supply the hardware and then a, a instructor at the participating school can take the little kids out on the bike ride and teach them safety. Well, most of it's done on the blacktop. There are a few schools that do take them out, you know, on a community ride, but most of it's done on the blacktop and it's those basic road riding school uh, skills of stopping, lane positioning, being able to look over your shoulder and see what's behind you, that type of things, yes. But they get the bikes, the helmets, the trailers, and the te it's PE teachers that are certified in the state curriculum. So you teach them to holler on your left? Yeah, we talk. Yes, you do talk. No, you do talk to them about giving an audible warning if you're passing somebody on a sidewalk. Yes. Well, no, I've, I, now that you mentioned it, I've actually seen the instructor with the kids on the bikes. Now I know what it is, but I didn't realize that PPO is supplying the trailers and the bicycles and the helmets. That's really pretty cool. It's a worthwhile program. Thanks yeah, they, for doing it. They loved it. In a year where they could have very easily said, we're not going to do it this year. Um, they were insistent on they wanted the bikes coming to the school this year. Hey, that cleaned that up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, Adam. Yes, I wanted to talk about the. Uh, I wanted to talk about the members, citizen members that are on the on the uh, committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that there's no representation from the northern end of Brevard County. Is that because there's no vacancy, or is that because there's no volunteers? So um, we have a staff member of the city of Tysol, but no, we don't have a citizen representation. I would have to check our roster right now. I'm not sure that we have an opening once we have the new gentleman from Rockledge. We might have one. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but um, it well, really is kind of a first serve, for, uh, first come, first serve basis. So if wow. you or you know someone who is a citizen of the of North Brevard would like to be a member, um, just email Lisa and I, and um, we'll be able to check the roster. And, and once someone does um, either step back or, um, you know, otherwise leave the BPAC, then we can definitely get, get someone on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when I started here last year as an alternate, there were 19 members on the committee. Yep. Now there's less. Did you restructure the committee? No. Nope. No, um, we had um, a member that left because they changed jobs and they're being replaced um, shortly. And then I don't think, I think that was our only member that we only turnover we've had. Well, there was a couple of vacancies yeah. that I noticed when I looked yeah. at the list back in the middle of last year. Mm -hmm. And I have a neighbor across the street that's really big into bicycling yeah. and, and, and I do a bit of walking myself. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. If we have a vacancy on, on it, then we, we'd love okay. to have you guys. Thank mm -hmm. you for the help. Yep. Thank yeah, you. In, in line with that, Sarah, I noticed we have a representative from the city of Palm Bay who never attended any of the meetings last year. So I'll talk to, uh, I'll talk to the Palm Bay city council and see yeah. if we can get somebody who will show up. That, that would be awesome. Thank you. A any other questions for, uh, for Sarah? Right. None. Thank you, Sarah. Now we move to our public engagement report uh, with Abby virtually. Abby, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abby Hemingway, and I'm the public involvement officer for the Space Coast CPO. I apologize for not being there in person today. I look forward to meeting our new members. The first thing that we're going to talk about today is taking a glance back at 2020. I'm a firm believer in looking back and celebrating our big accomplishments of the year. We all know that 2020 was very challenging and there's not one industry that didn't go untouched from COVID-19. And uh, as a TPO, we really had to rethink some of our strategies and some of our outreach tools. So I'm just gonna quickly go through um, some big accomplishments of last year. Next slide. So first and foremost, uh, we really wanted to highlight two major corridors that are now open. I'm sure many of you hopefully have driven these by now. One in the south area, the St. John's Heritage Parkway, uh, south extension there at Miko and the I-95 interchange that opened, um, uh, I think about in August or September. This was a huge north-south corridor that opened and as well as the Ellis interchange at 95. This now um, is a major entrance into really the heart of transportation leading right to the airport. And uh, I know that we are very excited about both of these projects now being able um, 
to let commuters and residents drive north and south in uh, different capacities. Next slide. I want to take a moment and um, really talk about our public involvement. Uh, as Sarah was kind of mentioning in her presentation before, we really had to uh, turn on our feet, so to speak, and think about the ways that we approach the public uh, now that we couldn't really get out on the streets and see them. So um, two of our biggest events last year, our first two virtual events actually had the highest attendance that we had seen in a very long time. And I think a lot of that had to do with how we promoted it on social media, how we made sure that we used our channels appropriately, and really uh, making sure that we also utilized our partnerships that we have in the community, which is huge. We did a lot of things last year that not every TPO or MPO did. And I think a lot of that has to do with our great relationships, not only with the cities and businesses, but also we have a great relationship with Brevard Public Schools as well. So we really saw a lot of um, engagement last year when some TPOs didn't. So it's awesome. Next slide. I think uh, we touched on this a little bit, but we did have a lot of safety improvements last year. Uh, we had saw the completion of the A1A safety project. We also had some intersection improvements at A1A and 520. And um, we have been very uh, you know, vocal and um, working with our partners there who live beachside, including the cities and townships. And um, as you can see, there's a photo up here of one of our uh, pop-up events that we did during Mobility Week, getting out on the streets and talking to people about how to properly use these traffic devices is key. And uh, you know, knowledge is power. So we're, we're very uh, happy that we're able to work with our partners and make sure that we have these safe, accessible roads. Next slide. And then here's just um, a glimpse of three of our biggest outreach and education events. So we were able to host some safe and effective outreach events. Um, we had one in August for Stop on Red Week. Shortly thereafter, we celebrated School Bus Safety Week. And then we also in October had Mobility Week. Uh, we not only did some in-person events in a safe capacity, making sure that we social distance and masked up, but we also, um, utilize virtual events as well to engage those who may not be as comfortable coming to in-person events. So we really love engaging and it's it's now nice that we get to do it in different ways. Next slide. And then of course it we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the major plans that we accomplished last year. Uh, we had the closing of our 2045 long range transportation plan. That's for new members that takes a two years to complete. So it was a very lengthy process and, and major kudos to Stephen Bostel, the project manager, he did a fantastic job. We also um, completed our vision zero action plan, which was a brand new plan for the TPO and saw a lot of engagement. And uh, Ms. Kim Smith was the project manager of that. It was a great, um, it was a great way to teach our local municipalities and communities about what Vision Zero is and how they can implement it in their own town or city. Next slide. So that's just a little brief recap for those um, who maybe weren't with us last year with the TPO. So uh, now we're gonna talk about some upcoming public involvement activities for the month of February. Next slide. So as most of you know, February is Black History Month. So we always take the opportunity to highlight some major um, influential black figures in transportation specifically. And um, it's really enlightening for our viewers on social media. And uh, we really love kind of making sure that we educate the public about some of these uh, major innovators and influencers. Next slide. And then we do have a uh, corridor study public meeting coming up. This is a uh, part two of the Mitten Road Feasibility Study, Final Concepts and Findings. This is a virtual public meeting. It's in a webinar format. It's on Wednesday, February 17th. And um, this study has a lot of engagement. The first public meeting that was held in August of last year had about 70 attendees. As of today, we have over 126 people registered. So there's a lot of interest in this study and um, the findings. Next slide. And on this slide, you can see how to access. You can register online 
And um, right now, the Mitten Road study website is also live for those who want to go in ahead of time and review the final roadway concepts and improvements and findings. They can do so and bring your questions and comments to the meeting on the 17th. And you can access that by going to www.mittenroadstudy.com. Next slide. And lastly, just coming up on the heels of March, and we'll report back uh, next month, of course, but we have bike month coming up. Uh, normally, we are very uh, out in the field for this month, and we might do some of that, but we're really um, trying to think of different ways that we can engage our online audiences in participating in bike month and what that might look like. So stay tuned to our social media channels because we're going to be planning some really neat things. And that's all I have. Oh, and here there's also, I'm sorry about this, there's also a full-size flyer of the Mitten Road uh, meeting in your agenda package just in case you wanted to hand it out to anyone that might live, work, or play in that area. Um, you can easily give this to them and they can get uh, keyed in to sign up for that meeting. Okay, thank you, Abby. Uh, do we have any questions for Abby? No questions, just a comment. Adam? Just wanted to commend the uh, staff on their uh, due diligence. They could have just said, hey, we can't do anything and let it go, but they uh, found alternatives and uh, attendance is up. That's a wonderful um, um, thing to say about the uh, the group. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Any other questions or comments? None, thank you, Abby. That brings us to our transit report, Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Terry Jordan, Space Coast Area Transit Planner. Terry, microphone's not on yet. It sounds like it's on. Oh, I just need to be closer, excuse me. Um, presented the transit report this evening. Uh, currently, fixed route transit ridership is pretty much status quo at about 70, 76% or so of our ridership by comparison to previous year. and approximately 80% overall year-to-year -year comparisons for our service as we are operating currently. Um, not sure if everyone is aware, there was a recent mask mandate put out by CDC. So previous to now, the uh, transit riders had the option of using a face mask while riding passenger transit. Now it's a mandatory uh, that they use a face mask. So we actually had to put out memos and things like that last week it went into effect as a matter of fact on February 1st so it was very quick and we had to respond very rapidly we've not seen any pushback as far as I know but uh we continue to make sure that we uh completely sanitize our vehicles as much as possible to ensure that the passenger general passengers are as safe as possible while they use lines in the service um in the report uh last last time I presented um Mr. Kohler had uh, asked for additional information regarding the three new routes that are being implemented. So as you see right now, we have uh, the route that is gonna be in Central Titusville. This is the routing. And then uh, the next slide is showing the schedule of the service. Uh, this is in response to numerous requests from passengers as well as uh, local officials in the area regarding um, development that's going on and um, the request for service. So we've implemented, well, we'll be implementing this uh, beginning in April, or early part of April. Uh, next route is going to be our Port St. John routing. Uh, this is an area that we've found that has had a need for service for a very long time, finally able to receive the funding and implement the service uh, along with the new service in Titusville starting in April. Uh, the schedule is showing next once as well, and both of these routes operate on an hourly headway, which pretty much means if you're catching the bus, it arrives once an hour to any particular location on the route, um, with the exception of midday service on Saturday, uh, which we um, remove an hour for lunch, and uh, there's no service for that that short period of time. Um, both of these routes connect with our overall service throughout the system, with the um, Port St. John connecting in uh, Coco Commons to Route 6, coming straight into downtown, oh, excuse me, coming straight into the Coco Transit Center in Coco, and the uh, uh, Titusville route connecting at the uh, shopping center at Titus Landing to several other routes that are existing service traveling throughout Titusville and then back into um, US-1, back into Coco. 
The additional new route is Route 26, which is actually a route that's in service currently, but it's being cut in half to have Route 30 as half of it, which will operate only on the beach. Currently, the bus runs from uh, uh, 19th Street and Cocoa Beach all the way up to Melbourne Airport on a two-hour headway. So like I mentioned earlier, that means once every two hours is when you can receive the service. So what we're going to do is cut it in half. The route is going to run the beach side up to um, Canova Beach Park and then return to 19th and Cocoa Beach. And the other half of the route will start at Canova Beach Park and run up Ogallee Causeway uh, into downtown Melbourne to Melbourne Airport and then back. And that both of those also operate on an hour headway. So it increases the frequency of service to any passenger right now by 50% automatically. Um, we also are gonna increase the service on Route 6, which is not in your packet. It's a current and existing route. We're just increasing the service on Saturday to 30 minute headways. So instead of the hour frequency that it operates right now, it'll operate on every 30 minutes. So those are the maps and the schedules as requested. So you can see uh, when the bus is operating with the time points for each location and um, exactly what time we have it scheduled to arrive at those locations. Um, another major project that I'm heading up is the uh, Intelligent Transportation Systems Project, which allows passengers to now track, well, not just yet, but we're about to implement it pretty soon, hopefully, where the vehicle is and when they will arrive at their location. We've, as I mentioned last time, we've installed all of the hardware. We're now in the testing phase. We actually turned on the system last week to kind of check it out. Uh, make sure that it's making the announcements as it should at the um, particular passenger stops, um, that it's tracking where the vehicles are located uh, correctly, and that it also is displaying the destination sign. So right now the route has a destination sign. If it goes out, one thing's showing. When it returns, another thing shows. We're trying to make sure that they are um, being reflective of the correct destination. Uh, and then the last component is the automated passenger counter, so we can tell how many people are on, the, on board the vehicle at any point in time um, at its location, and we can tell how many people are boarding the vehicle at each particular stop location. So when we do things like install new shelters, we know the highest utilized location, so we can determine which will be the best locations. Speaking of shelters, if you've been out on 520, you may have seen the new uh, shelters that we've installed with uh, conjunction with the Mary Island Redistribution Redevelopment Agency, excuse me, very bright colored shelters, very highly visible. They currently have things like solar lighting, um, solar compacting, trash cans, uh, bicycle repair stations. So they're they're unique to the county, but and they're hopefully the first of a few that we'll be uh, implementing. Our next partner is Satellite Beach. May not include all the amenities, but we think that they'll be very visible the same way, and I expect that it'll be uh, highly uh, utilized and um, well received there as well. Um, that's it for my report. If there are any questions, yeah, any questions, Terry? Pete. Yeah, hey Terry, uh, that decrease in ridership by down to 75, 80 percent. I, I believe that's job related, but that, that not being the case, is that going to impact your level of service? I mean, because it's definitely impacting your revenue. And you're going to have to get that money from someplace to make up for the lack of ridership. If you don't get that money, are we going to get less bus service or how's all that going to work out? So currently, um, CARES Act funding has supplanted the passenger fares, which is a small portion of our revenue by overall. Um, we heavily depend on state grants, FTA grants, local funding and our marketing. So our marketing currently has not been reduced, uh, in which if you look at it, and most of our buses, they have wraps or or, or, or designated like um, um, advertising on both sides. And those have continued to actually increase instead of decrease. So we've received you know, a good amount of money in marketing dollars that has not been reduced. Uh, so to answer your question, we do not expect any reduction in service overall uh, as a result of the decreased ridership. Okay, thank you. You're David. Welcome. I've got one comment on the Port St. John route. Thank you very much. That's a sorely needed service for that area. I do have one comment on Camp Road. Uh, there's there's apparently some a work camp uh, just across from the jail. There's a tremendous number of workers that leave that facility early in the morning and they come back late in the evening. 
that's a two lane road with almost no no sidewalk. They can that was, there is no sidewalk, and there's people constantly walking up and down that road. It's a danger. <laughs> I almost hit people several times. I used to work at the jail. I almost hit people several times trying to drive to and from work. Uh, kind of explore moving that that route up from Canaveral Groves Boulevard up to Camp Road. I think will benefit a lot of people. I, there's definitely a need on Camp Road. Um, actually, I agree with you completely, and that was one of the route. I'm sorry, one of the roadways that we um, took a look at prior to the implementation of service, um, and it was determined, I guess, over the group that Canaveral Groves would be uh, the initial and best utilized uh, segment. However, uh, as of any service, we put it, we implement, and then we um, take a look at it. And especially now that we'll have this automated passenger oh, yeah. counter technology, we can actually see what the ridership looks like at a specific location anytime I can track uh, daily ridership, monthly ridership, by the hour, by the trip. So I can tell if it's gonna be something that will, will help. But I completely agree with you. That is actually, I got a request maybe about a month or two ago regarding the adding a bus stop at this uh, intersection, just to ensure that the um, individuals that are reporting for, uh, I wanna say it was probation, currently right, right. Was, Right. Another location. It's this a work is program. Thank you. Um, that they will have access to the uh, to the facility as well. Of a number of patrons that, as you said, start their day, start their day, and then with the with the transit system, and currently they go up to US one. Yep. And they uh, return in the evening. So we do know that there's there's a um, demand in that area as well. Yeah, there's um, probably probably 35, maybe 40 workers that walk that road every morning and every evening. It I means there's just a ton of people, and they don't have they don't have a car. Obviously, they don't have transportation, right. but they do have to go to US one to catch a bus. Right. Now, this do, this do will be a little bus on US one. Exactly, and this will be a little bit closer. But I completely agree with you. We do know that there's there's a need. Um, we we expect that we may be able to implement that with an alternate trip potentially, where that, one yeah. trip will go up uh, Canaveral Groves, and then the second trip will go up Camp Road and to specifically serve the times of day yep. where they'll be yep. utilized early in the morning late in the evening exactly exactly thank you thank you for the uh, uh comment hey greg you had something uh would you pass the microphone to greg uh yeah terry uh real quick just a, a couple of quick questions uh your new route 11 uh were you able to get that to meet route six uh, at the Cocoa Commons? Exactly, yes. Yeah, we um, we strive to make connections. And that, as I mentioned, once the route reaches Cocoa Commons, the passengers can disembark there and then get Route 6 and then travel into Cocoa, into the transit center, and then on from there if need be. Okay. Uh, your ITS, you're in testing right now. Uh, your projection for going operational? Um, we expect a soft launch within the next, and, and please don't hold me to this time frame because we're in the burning phase. <laughs> So hopefully we don't find any major hiccups, but within the next month and a half to two months, potentially. And uh, your new shelter, uh, the high tech shelter, uh, does that still fall within the, the 10 to 15,000 cost range? I think you, I had asked you something like that before. So uh, no, it does. Uh, let, me, let me answer this way. The shelter itself, yes. The amenities are additional costs, and that's why we partnered with the Mary Island Redevelopment Agency because uh, Myra included the additional funding for those amenities, like I mentioned, the Big Belly Solar Trash Pan, the uh, bike repair station, the solar light, things of that nature. But the shelter itself and the installation costs are still within that range. Did that include lighting? Uh, the solar light inside of the shelter. Okay. Uh, there's, additional so, uh, there's an additional solar light pole that's independent of the shelter. That's uh, an option. Exactly. Okay. Which was additional cost. Right, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Terry? Comment. Adam. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. I appreciate you um, taking my suggestion several months ago and doing something with it. Uh, I've found that a lot of times government officials are reluctant to do a lot of things because it can cause a lot of questions instead of answering them. You're welcome. Um, what are your plans for um, announcing the availability of this route? Are you planning on starting to announce a month ahead of time, or are you going to wait until the route actually starts? No, actually, excuse me. <laughs> Plural, routes. Excuse me. Um, 
So we have a, a marketing firm that actually does the marketing for us, and we expect that we'll be doing some advertising and marketing um, uh, prior to the, the implementation of the route, probably about a month or so, especially in these areas where there's brand new service. We want to make sure that the uh, service is identified and that individuals in the areas know about it and then can utilize it once it goes into effect. Um, we went out last week to um, start the process for installing the actual physical bus stop signs. So that in itself is advertising because when someone sees a bus stop sign, the first question is, where's the bus? So we, we know that will do it for us to start, but um, we keep them bagged until it's time for the service to actually start. But yes, we have a marketing team that will be going out and um, and sending out whatever materials to advertise the service being uh, started up. And I have a question. When will the brochures for the three new routes be available? Um, I work as a volunteer at the Chamber of Commerce, and we have three of your bus routes in our racks. And I want to know when I can go ahead and order them. And I don't want to be ordering them too soon because that's not fair to you. Actually, so what, what you can do is we can work directly together. You let me know when. I'm sorry, I'll let you know exactly when because we actually finalized the product. We're actually still finalizing the overall schedules and um, uh, additional um, materials and uh, probably within the next three or four weeks we'll have them printed and inventoried and ready for distribution. I'll with you next month then, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the bus stops. Uh, I My term in Myra ended this past December, December 31st, but I worked for the last several years on helping to develop those bus stops bus shelters, and I would recommend that you folks, any any other areas that want to use them, get in touch with Larry Lalo at Myra, because they've done a good job on putting together manufacturer distribution, et cetera, et cetera, and I would re highly recommend it because they're they were great, great uh, shelters. Definitely, uh, and we work with partners, usually local municipalities, but working with Myra has been, they're, they're as mentioned, they're unique to the county. They're the first of their kind with all the amenities uh, so if you haven't been out to that area any long, anywhere along 520 between Newfoundland and up to uh, Kiwanis Island, you'll see the brand new shelters installed. And uh, they're definitely uh, very, um, very pleasing to the eye. Okay, any other questions or comments for Terry? Arlen. There is uh, yeah, okay. Oh, it's green. Okay, now I got it. Uh, how is the number nine trolley working out? Comments, good, bad, different? Um, I'm, I'm just gonna say it this way. I, I, I have not heard any negative comments. Um, the service, of course, is still the same as it was, but it's the, the vehicle for, the vehicle itself is on display if you saw it at the very beginning of, um, uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, it it's, continues to be well utilized service but I don't know that we've had any negative comments. I know we've kind of had a, a couple of anecdotal um, riders that, that do like the new styling of the trolley, going back to you know the beach tide type trolley that existed many years ago. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say it that way. No, I know, I think they went into effect the day after our last meeting and yeah. Correct. It looked very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Terry. Thank that you. That brings us down to, uh, to our last uh, last item, our local government report. Uh, David, you do want to continue your, your comments about the talks? Just to reiterate, I, I don't know who looks into it, but uh, the effectiveness of the signs at the mid-block crosswalk, I mean, we've already got flashing lights. We've got everything but a tornado siren. But uh, these things, I think, are more of a distraction. I've even seen people late at night aim for them. Uh, so they get beat up. They don't last too long. They get beat up regularly. And I, th I think they're more of a distraction than they are. Look out, you got a pedestrian walkway coming up because people end up focusing on on going through there and uh, the roadway is not that wide there anyway if you've got a truck heaven forbid 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to specifically comment on those signs. This is not opening this for debate about whether you like these crosswalks, don't like these crosswalks. That's not on today's agenda, but I will comment about the signs. Um, in our community traffic safety team meeting, FDOT was discussing them and the amount of time and money they were spending on maintenance. Um, they are very pleased with how they are working. Listen to what you've said several times. You're, so, you're focused on the roadway, which is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to draw your attention to that crosswalk. They have had people eat, um, hitting them on purpose. The time and maintenance and money that's going in to repairing them, and they are getting reports people are hitting them on purpose. They're looking to see if there's an alternative. They don't want to get rid of them because they think they are being effective. The speed limit is down by at least 10 miles an hour um, on A1A, which is what they wanted to do. But they are looking at, to see if there's something else that they could do that would be equally as effective. Okay, Pete, you had something. Oh, yeah. On our, on our FBs, I actually have a lot of road crossings. I actually have a lot. When I go to a red light and I push the button, there's a sign that says, stop, look, and listen. Don't walk in front of traffic until you see traffic stop. I learned that in elementary school. Stop, look, and listen. Don't walk in front of traffic unless you see traffic stop. That's my responsibility as a bicyclist and a pedestrian. Now, the drivers, their responsibility is if they see somebody in the crosswalk, they're obligated to stop. That doesn't happen automatically. Uh, out on Amelia Island, when I'm on a bicycle there, I don't even have to hit the RFB button. Cars stop automatically. When I hit Barna and the fire station where the West Off Trail ends, I could be in that uh, crosswalk for five minutes and nobody's going to stop because they're just not used to seeing pedestrians and bicyclists. It's a marriage. The more people that use the facilities, the more the motorists are going to be aware of them and the more respectful they're going to get. As for the pedestrian, they have to understand, you don't walk in front of moving traffic. You wait for traffic to stop. Those cars are heavy. They hit you, it's going to hurt. And, 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 you know, for the drivers, as they see more and more people use the facilities, they'll get more polite. Is everybody going to get polite? Well, you see red, red, run, or red, right, or red light runners on the TV, right? Not everybody's going to obey it, but enough people will where you could have a good effect of crossing if you just be a little bit patient. And that's just the reality, RFBs. Are they a red light? No, but they're a hell of a lot better than nothing. And that's all I have to say on it. Yeah, I agree, Peter. I think it comes back to education and enforcement, really. Yeah. Uh, Arlon, you had something? Yeah, down there on the, uh, the flashing lights, the post that the gentleman was talking about, they did take those off on the right-hand side of the road. It used to be three of them, left, center, and right. And I don't know, some months back, they took the ones off on the right-hand side. And I'll be very honest with you, when I drive that, I only drive in that right-hand lane, so I'm not there trying to hit one of those posts or whatever you want to call them. But I, I, I really think that they are a distraction. Anyone else? Seeing none, that ends our, our meeting. Our next meeting will be uh, March 8th, uh, right here at the same time. Thank you all for your attendance uh, in person, virtually. Thank you, staff. Meeting is adjourned. Good seeing you again. Pardon? Good seeing you again. Hey, Adam, same to you, man. So the read us. I guess we're going back to normal altogether next month.